adventure on animal senses for the fourth grade. My name is Dr. Joyce Bluford. I'm a scientist who studies the earth. I'm a geologist by trade, but I love to get kids excited about science. So today we're going to take a look at how animals, including ourselves, because remember we're an animal, um, how we perceive the world and how they perceive the world. So um, we're going to go to the first slide. Now, how many senses do we have? Now you see on the little board there it says we have five. I want you to think about other animals. Do they have more than the five? Do they have less? Do they use them differently than we do? That's what we're going to investigate today. So today um, I'm here at the Children's Natural History Museum. Uh, we usually do field trips, but now we have to do them virtually, but you'll still learn the same information. So let's find out what the five human senses are. In most animals, the brain is the center for processing all senses. Humans have five senses. We receive signals from our eyes so that we can see, signals from our skin so we can feel touch, signals from our ears so we can hear, signals in our nose so we can smell, and signals from our tongue so we can taste. That's Phoebe. She's my assistant today. So she's going to do little uh, clips in between so we kind of put this all together. Now, so we have five senses, but the, the main, the key is this brain, not only for humans, but for all other animals. The brain is the controller of how we feel and incorporate our, our, our surroundings. So we're going to learn a lot about, uh, this is a, the shape of a human brain. This is probably about the size of mine. Yours would probably be a little smaller. You're in the fourth grade, so your brain is about fully cooked. Um, that means that most of the receptors are already created. So, um, But before the fourth grade, they're usually still growing and growing neurons. So let's take a look at this brain because it is important. It is the, the computer of how your body functions. So if you think about it, when I'm holding something, how do I know it's cold or hot? How do I know not to touch something? Well, it's because the, your touch has neurons in it. You have these nerves that go up and down over and to your brain. Now, if we look at Charlie here, Charlie is plastic, so it's not real. Charlie here has a whole network of um, neurons going through here. So this is the spinal cord or your backbone. But what the backbone is protecting is this nervous system. And it, that nervous system allows you to sense reason why I want to go into the human one is because all other animals have a very similar system. They have to reach. So in order for Charlie, well, Charlie doesn't have a brain in here, so I have to hold its hand. But so if it's, uh, if it's you and you say, okay, move, you're, you're signaling your hands to move. And we have different types of neurological um, connections. So if you look at this picture here, there's different parts of the brain that have different senses. Now, this is our brain, and you notice we have a frontal lobe, we have a temporal lobe, a pateal lobe back in here, an occipital lobe back there, and down here we have the cerebellum, and then the brain stem. Each a brain stem that kind of brings um, all those nerves together. So these different parts of the brain sense different things. And so as we go through the different animals, some of the brains are gonna be bigger than others. So first of all, we have to figure out if you know the phylum animalia. We all belong to um, a kingdom of life. Now, if you look at this picture here, you have Protista, 
which is down on the bottom here. These are primitive organisms. Now they don't really have a, um, a brain and we're not going to, to deal with these, but they do sense their uh, surroundings. Um, there's also the fungi group of, of um, those would be mushrooms. We're not going to talk about those. There's plants. Plants also re, um, have different ways of signaling their environment. And of course you have these bacteria, these uh, different sets of bacteria. So we're just going to deal with what we call animalia. Now, animalia is a very, very diverse group, and we're, I want to make sure you kind of understand where they will go. Now, look at this guy here. He's a crab. Now, a crab, does it have a backbone? Let's go back to Charlie here. Does Charlie have a backbone? Do you have a backbone? Yes. This little guy, which belongs to the arthropods, does not have a backbone. And so we're going to look at some of the way those sense, so those would be called invertebrate. Scientifically, this is our vertebrae. And each of the little, um, and each vertebrae kind of moves so that our backbone doesn't snap that uh, nervous, nervous system. Now, so this is close up of that nervous system in here. The red is the nervous system. And then the bones here are protecting it. And the gooey stuff here is what we call cartilage, and that helps us to move. Just like if you never notice, we can bend over like that. Well, if it was stiff, we couldn't bend. Now, so let's take a look at some of this phylum animalia, because those are the ones we want to um, check their senses out. This is a little video quickly of all of the different groups. So we get a really quick look at how these go. First one is a periphera. They don't have a brain. And so they really sense the environment around them. Notice that they're floating and they're using the powers of hydraulics to kind of move around. And their little tentacles actually sense. Then you have annelids or worms. These worms are there have segmented bodies and they have little brains. Then you have the arthropods, and that includes crabs and other land insects and uh, spiders and stuff like that. How do they perceive? Then you have the group mollusca. Mollusca are things like snails and uh, clams. How do they perceive their environment? Um, do they have a brain? Echinoderms. These are actually a lot more sophisticated invertebrates than they look, but these guys are sophisticated. Now you have Priozoa. Uh, this is another small group, and the Brachiopods. They're all sensing their environments with little, notice there's little things coming out of these different groups of uh, invertebrates. Now we have the vertebrates. There's five. Amphibians, reptiles, fish and, and remember these all have backbones birds and of course the the group that we belong to is the mammals here's some elephants here so they all have all of these vertebrates have brains we're going to take a little closer look at that the invertebrates, depending on how primitive they are, and we started with those kind of funny spongy ones, they don't have a brain, but then as you go up to the more sophisticated echinoderms, they have brain centers, so they sense their environment differently than the vertebrates do. So, how do animals sense? Now let's take a look at the left-hand side, and you'll notice these are the five vertebrates. You have the fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal. Obviously, which one's the larger brain? The mammals. The mammals can sense things and, and retain things and have different um, storage capacity than some of the others. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the term bird brain. That's meaning that it's smaller than ours. But if you look at all the other ones, they're pretty small too. Um, some of them are 
uh, more primitive than others. Some of them do have those uh, areas that I showed you, but they all have uh, the, their brain is their computer system. Now let's go over to the right hand side. If you go over to the right hand side, you'll notice that there these are the invertebrates. Now invertebrates, um, now guys, remember I told you guys not to um, raise your hand yet? That will be the last 10 minutes, okay? So now we're going to uh, look at the invertebrates. And you notice they have like little nodes and these little nodes are helped to control their uh, center there. So um, as we go through more of these animals, we're going to take a, look, a closer look at how they use them. Now, humans versus other animals. We have five senses. Phoebe, Phoebe showed that very nicely. We have five senses, including our ear, our taste, our sight, our touch, and our smell. Each one has, um, depending on the different humans, some have a better sense of smell, some have a better taste sense, some have better eye sense, um, so there's different um, varieties, but how do you compare them with other animals? Well, does animals have more or less? Most of them have maybe a little bit more because they don't have the processing capacity. Like in our brain here, this brain is like a, a really top-notch computer where some of the other animals are not. And so sometimes they have other sensory um, neurons that they can take. One is chemo or a chemical signals from the surroundings. Humans cannot. Um, magnetic humans do not. We have birds that fly in different patterns that have a magnetic sense of the world. Then we also have sonar like bats um, uh, and, and some other animals that can um, figure out shape, especially in the dark by sonar. And then some of the animals have better sense of smell, like a dog, for instance. Some dogs have a most dogs have a much better sense of smell than we do. So different animals will have accentuated um, senses or less. But humans, because we're human, you know your senses. You, we have to compare our senses to their senses. Now, first I'd like to kind of read a little story, or Phoebe is going to read the story, about ants. Ants have, well, at the end, will try to encapsulate how they operate because you've seen ants a lot of times you don't like them but they are very curious and they interpret their world differently even Benjamin Franklin was was in in awe of how they sense their environment so let's read Ant Trails. Ant Trails by Joyce Bluford animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tewaldi read by Phoebe Chen. Walking home from school, I spotted an anthill along the sidewalk. I had my magnifying glass with me, just in case I saw something interesting. I was amazed at how the ants work together. Most worker ants are in a marching pattern. They spend most of their time moving food into the colony. Their motion was mainly predictable in a straight line. However, some ants have a zigzag motion, going in and out of the marching ants. I wonder if they were cleaning up, or maybe they were bosses keeping everyone in line. There was another motion that seemed to be very directed, as if there was a scent they were following. This was a small group of ants that looked like they were scouting for food. Some ants would greet each other by touching their antenna and then continue on their way. The ants would continue walking even if it meant going up over an obstacle. Emilio walked by to see what I was doing. I knew him from school because he helps us little kids in science lab. Ants are pretty awesome, Emilio declared. Do you know they make up about 15 to 20 percent of all living creatures in the world? There are over 12,000 different kinds of ants. Scientists think there may be at least 10,000 more that we have not discovered. 
Emilio just loves to provide these little facts that I sometimes don't understand. Emilio, this is not school. Can I just enjoy looking at the ants? I interjected. But Cody, you could not possibly know all there is to know about ants. I knew I would not be able to quiet Emilio, so I just listened. Do you know how far ant hills go into the earth? I hated when he asked questions to make me think. Scientists have looked into some large ant hills and discovered that they create a huge network of trails and rooms. They move as much soil as earthworms. The large amounts of soil that they move help increase air and water into the ground. Ants are nature's best decomposer of dead things. They can break down almost anything into small particles that brings nutrients to the soil. Ants also eat many other insects, even larger ones. They help keep the environment in balance. I finally had enough. Emilio, please let me look at these ants so I can learn their different movements by observing. You're ruining it for me. I'm sorry, Cody, Emilio replied. I sometimes get too excited about facts. He continued anyway. Did you know that Benjamin Franklin would record his observations on ant movements? He took one ant and put it on a string with molasses on the end. He found out that the ants communicate by their body movement and chemistry, because that one ant brought the other ants from the colony right to the string. Emilio finally left, and I spent another hour watching the ants move everything from pieces of leaves to dead insects into the ant colony. I even saw the queen ant move with many ants helping her do everything. As she laid her eggs, other ants would take them away to a safe part of the colony. When I got home, my mother asked me why it took so long to come home. Just met up with some ants. I replied. My mother looked confused. But they live in New York. I reflected a little at that funny reply, and then I understood. I replied to my mom, not those kinds of ants. I meant ants that marched all day long. Fun facts. The average lifespan of an ant is 45 to 60 days. The ant has very strong legs, which help it to run very quickly. An ant is able to lift about 20 times its own body weight. Adult ants are unable to swallow solid food. They depend on the juice they are able to squeeze out from pieces of food. An ant uses its antenna for touch as well as smell. There is at least one queen in each ant colony. An ant has two stomachs. In one stomach, it stores food for itself and in the other, it stores food that is to be shared with other ants. An ant has the largest brain among insects. Queen ants are provided with wings at birth. They lose these wings after they fly off to start new colonies. Worker ants are given the responsibility of taking the rubbish from the nest and putting it into the rubbish dump. When a worker ant finds a source of food, it leaves a trail of scent to attract other ants in the colony to it. The end. So what we see here is, this is, remember, an invertebrate. It does not have a backbone. It's too small to need a backbone. Um, but this ant has a large brain in, in comparison to a lot of other invertebrates, making it a very, very um, smart, animal or invertebrate. Um, so now notice it's scent. Now certain groups have better senses than other. And this is important because this is how they run their society. And so their senses created an environment that they have, in, they are in every single nook and cranny in the world. So very, very, um, a very good animal. Okay, now let's take a look at taste. Um, well, that's one of our senses. Now, how can you tell what these little babies are, are doing? Now, the first baby, uh, number one, is eating something sour. 
and then number two same thing they have that look on them you know you when you've touched something that means that your taste buds now remember this it's not that it's just here it has to go from your tongue uh, to your brain and say it's sour and I don't think I like it then especially on humans it imprints it so whenever you see sense of uh, uh, sight you see a lemon you might not want it anymore because you remember that sensation that you have from this lemon now hearing now look at what you can tell he doesn't like something in picture number one but let's look at <laughs> <laughs> now so he was hearing or was he feeling because you have to remember when there's a lot of loud noise it could push you and then his ears and he just kind of went crazy so hearing it's a sense of um, getting now let's look at the ear here where does it go let's look at this model here kind of a big one here but it goes from the ear the sound and that's why if you if, if you look at your own ear it's capturing around it and then it goes in here and there's all these there's an eardrum and all these other cool things in there um, that's why you don't want to put anything in your ear because you don't want to break any of these sensitive things and then it is transmitted to your brain and then you interpret it and that's just what that little baby was um, uh, try to figure out how far away things are we'd have to do some math so some of these senses we can still do like we create on an airplane we can emulate some other uh, the way animals do it but for these animals to figure out height and to be able to go straight down and catch a prey like as small as a mouse in the case of the owls and there's a lot of birds that do it lots of hawks uh, osprey eagles they can go right down see it kind of hear it and then get down there and, and grab it and have dinner. So ears. Now let's look at these. Ears are important and they're different in different animals. Um, if you look at number one there, the, uh, the, um, the animal there has a little hearing coming up like that. Notice how it goes back and forth. It's kind of like we can't do that. In order for us to hear like over there you'd have to go like that but some animals have this movement if you look at number two same with the deer the deer is able to move that ear around now and if you see number three you have a kitty cat which can also move its ears and it's getting um, I think it's playing with the ears I don't think he's trying to eat that big uh, rabbit but the rabbit has more bigger ears because it has to rely on it in case something is going to hurt it so that hearing is important for us it's not as important um, because we can move our uh, it, it's not one of the our sight and um, our, our hearing is important but we don't have to worry about a prey because we can also see it okay so how do animals how do humans see and this is actually how all the other vertebrates kind of see. It goes through our, so let's take a look at the eye here. So it goes in here, in the pupil here, and then inside here is a lens. And what happens is that when we see a certain path, because remember, we can only see certain angles. Um, it, and so when it sees that, it goes to the end of the, um, so if you look over here on the, show you with here. So the tree here, notice that the tree is backwards on the outside of the uh, eye. Then it's transmitted to the brain. Now the brain does something awesome because our eyes actually see everything backwards or upside down. And then our brain interprets it to see right side up. So it's a combination. You can't see correctly without this brain. Now, somebody who's blind, their neur neurons could be severed or there could be uh, different problems along what they call 
um, the optic nerve. So um, th this eye is, is real important for us to see. This is very similar to other animals. Now, though, if you're a fish, like a shark or something, um, your eyes are a little bit different because it's a little different in the water to be able to see. So there's certain uh, animals that have different eyesight. So let's look at number one. We have a liz lizard there. Look at the way the eyelids are. It closes down like that. Ours go up and down um, to protect our eyes. Number two, you can see where the, uh, the pupil gets larger. Now that you can do that little experiment on your own eye or on your parents or another sibling, get a flashlight, put it to it, and you'll see your pupils getting larger and smaller. It controls how much light gets in there. Because remember, you really can't see at night. There is, though, one animal that does see at night. And which one is that? A cat, the infrared. And, and there's lots of other animals, but they can see different signals at night. Now look at the little baby at three. What is she reacting to? Oh my God, I just seen something weird. I don't want to go that way. And so sight is actually, um, she didn't feel anything. She just saw that there was probably danger and she needed to go the other way or somebody scared her. <coughs> now, how does a bee see? Now a bee is, what is it? A vertebrate or invertebrate? Does it have a backbone? No, so it's an invertebrate. But how does a bee see? It doesn't see like we are, so let's... So a bee sees differently than a human. And its eyes are what we call compound eyes. They have many different eyes, so that, that's a whole nother subject. But if you ever notice, there's certain flowers, the colors that are attracted to bees. A lot of times the flowers that you buy um, at uh, a, a nursery might not they they try not to attract bees because bees can sting humans and humans don't like to get stung so a lot of times you'll see different colors attract bees but that nectar so a, if a bee sees a flower that doesn't have anything that it needs it goes right past it so this is kind of important to if you're trying to make a pollinator garden to make sure you have the right kind of flowers that the bees can see. Now, let's take a look at what uh, human vision at night. So look at, uh, at number one. If you go down deep in, inside the water, a human can't see anything. There's no light coming in. But a deep sea fish, their vision and their eyes can see things like that is uh, an octopus looking around and he, they can see with the way their eyes are set. Now look at a snake. Does a snake see something different? Like a human vision, um, well, we're not interested in eating that little mouse, but the snake is. And so what does the snake see? See something very aha. If I'm quiet, I can get it so they can pinpoint their uh, attack on it for their dinner. Now, let's go to touch. You know, we, touch is very important to humans because our whole, we have one organ, that's the largest organ on our body, and that is the skin. Now the skin, just think about it, we touch everything, um, and, and that's the, and we, we crave to hold and to hug. Um, and so touch is very important to us. Many, it's very important to many other organisms too. Now look at that um, lizard there. Why is he picking his feet up? Well, it's too hot. He senses it's too hot and he doesn't want to get burned. On number two, why in the world is a baby laughing? And then usually as the babies get older, they don't. That's because they're just developing their sense of touch. You have to remember, skin is an organ. And over here, it's very complicated, but this then, there's all these neurons that go to your brain to interpret. Now, even that little reptile there, the, um, the, uh, the turtle, the turtle, it, does it like being rubbed? Obviously, because you got to remember that shell is part of its backbone, and so it's feeling something. 
Okay, now, other things that touch. So, things like a mollusk, or a, this is a snail, which belongs to the mollusca group, it is using its little antennae and, and suction underneath it to figure out kind of where it's going. It's trying to sense where it's going. And a lot of times that is touch, even though we might think it's like an antenna getting in sound, it's not. Now number two um, is a jellyfish. You've seen a lot of pictures of those. Those are all the, the, the tentacles, which are down like this, is everything to do with touch. So in order to eat, a fish has to by accident go through it. That's why going all over the place, it gets crap captured in there and that signals to the jellyfish to start eating it. It digests it on the outside. <coughs> now, spiders um, can touch help them see? Well, especially even in humans, touch a blind person, their sense of touch is accentuated. So let's look what a spider does. This bizarre arachnid not only walks on water, it can read the underwater world with its legs. Millions of tiny spikes detect vibrations on the water's surface. It can accurately judge where the movement is coming from and even what prey item it is. A male lives in this section of the pond and it's full of food. His back legs anchor him to the shore, while his super-powered feet get to work. Every little vibration is assessed. The fish was just out of reach. So imagine doing that or having all the sensories um, so you can capture your environment. You got to remember we're all adapting to our environment. Now let's take a look at smell. Now on number one, the guy is smelling something maybe not too good. And so it goes up the nose. And it also has, your brain is interpreting what it's smelling. So, um, and number two is a cartoon, but that's, it goes up your nose and you're smelling it. Some animals like um, uh, smell cannot be just in the nose because a lot of them have, think about it, a, a fish, they're in the ocean, their nose is, is maybe not smelling like we would smell. Um, and then number three, what is that little baby doing? Uh-oh, daddy's feet don't smell too good. So we're, we're seeing that we, ha we adapt these smells. Now, a lot of times, depending on where you're born, will depend upon what kind of smells feel good to you. So not everybody likes lilac. Not everybody likes jasmine. Um, it, it depends on what we've been brought up to, and then we adapt to those smells. Okay, but what animal do, is our best friend that sp smells very good? Let's look at the dog. Like us, dogs can tell if smells are coming from the left or right because their nasal passages are completely divided. But here's how Zinka totally outdoes us. When she sniffs in, most of the air goes into her lungs but some of it splits off into a separate stream that goes into a special chamber called an olfactory recess. Inside, there's an intricate maze of little passages. Here's a researcher scan of what it looks like in cross-section. All those twists and turns create a huge surface area, which hold more than half a billion sensory cells that feed information to the brain. 
that's 15 times more than we have. All of our sensory cells are in this little patch. And we don't have a special chamber for smelling. When Zinka exhales, the air is blasted out the sides through those slits, so she can take in a fresh sample each time. Yeah, so see the dog can take in a fresh sample. You know sometimes, even if you're not in the room with that smell, you could still smell it. That's because it gets kind of trapped in our nasal passages. So they have more neurons in a certain area and then can smell more. We're going to kind of look at that at the end to do some experiments to figure out where we have more sensory. Okay, now let's take it. We looked at, remember the first little storybook was about an ant and, and all of that they can touch. Now, we're going to now look at a harbor seal. Now, harbor seals, just in case you don't know, we have a large population of, of baby harbor seals down at Maori Slough off in Newark. Um, and so, um, these harbor seals are looking for an area where they can have their babies that's safe and then they go out to the San Francisco Bay. But uh, this is about FOCA, um, the traveling harbor seal, and the senses and the surroundings that they see. So let's uh, learn all about FOCA. FOCA, the traveling harbor seal, by Joyce Bluford, animated by Doris Rea, Read by Phoebe Chen. Foka was born in the San Francisco Bay on a foggy May day. After 10 months in her mother's belly, she was born and ready for her life as a pup. She noticed that other mothers were having their babies in the same place, an area called Maori Slough. Foka's mother thought she looked like a white plump sausage and hoped that Foka could swim. Foka's mom was five years old and Foka was her first baby. The new mom wasn't sure about anything. She wondered if she would be a good mother to Foka. Foka's white coat made her stand out from the other new pups. It meant that she was born a little early and her fur did not have enough time to turn brown gray like most other harbor seals. Foka would cry out, Ma, for her mother to nuzzle and groom her. Foka instinctively looked for food by nudging her mom's belly, looking for a bottle tip. When she started to suck, a warm white liquid delighted her mouth. Foka thought to herself that being a harbor seal would be easy. Within two weeks, Foka started to catch fish and gobble them down. As she was feeding, she felt a strange sensation from her whiskers. They were really not just whiskers, but sensitive hair called vibrissae. Eventually, she would learn that these sensitive extensions from her face would help her feel in the murky world of the San Francisco Bay. Each vibrissa can feel things independently. Foka would be able to sense her prey's vibrations in the water. On land, Foka noticed that she could not see things well even though she had big eyes. As she entered the water, she could see very well in the murky water. Mucus always coated her eyes to protect them. The mucus almost made her look sad when she was on land because it looked like tears. However, Foka was always happy. Foka loved to swim using all four short webbed flippers. The hind flippers would propel her through the water and the four flippers with their short claws would guide the way. She was able to swim forward and upside down. Her mother kept telling her to slow down, but she loved to cruise around 12 miles per hour, a fast pace for marine mammals. Foka's mom was always ready to play. She would chase Foka and even let her ride on her back. Foka had a wonderful life, but when she was six weeks, everything changed. Her mother started paying attention to a handsome male seal. Foka was now old enough to take care of herself. Foka was confused and did not really understand what was going on. 
However, she did notice that the other pups about her age were by themselves without their mothers. They swam, ate, slept, and looked happy. Boca concluded that being on your own was normal and natural. She was happy again. She started to communicate with pups that were a little older. They kept telling Foca to see the world and travel. Her mom always told her not to go too far from where she was born because there were dangerous sharks in the ocean, especially the Great White. After one year, Foca was still growing and now weighed 150 pounds. She thought she was ready to travel and see the rest of the San Francisco Bay. Many of her seal friends told her of glorious animals that lived in the bay. Foca took out a map of the San Francisco estuary and plotted her trip. She would swim north to Castro Rock and maybe swim under the Golden Gate Bridge and beyond, all the way out into the Pacific Ocean. As she swam north, she saw wonderful flying creatures overhead. One large bird had a long funny beak and a six and a half foot wingspan. These brown pelicans were flying to seal rock where many birds like to socialize. Sometimes they would plunge head first into the water for their dinner. Focus saw noisy birds called western gulls. They sounded like they were fighting as they scavenged for food. She saw other birds called cormorants as they looked for fish from above. They were excellent fishermen and they usually did not miss. Boca saw them on rocks with their wings outstretched to dry themselves because their feathers were not waterproof like many other birds. Then there were some birds that Foca saw only a few times, like the California clapper rail, western snowy plover, and California least tern. Some of the other seals told her that these birds were abundant at one time, but as humans started to make salt along the sides of the bay, they lost their habitat. Near the Golden Gate Bridge, she saw large seals. Victor, an older harbor seal, told her they were California sea lions because you could see that their ears were on the outside. Boca had never noticed that her own ears were not visible. The California sea lions were large and looked like dangerous torpedoes in the water. One day, while sleeping in the water in a bottling position, her body submerged with just her head exposed, she suddenly felt something bump into her. Fear overtook her body as she thought a great white was going to eat her. She thrust her head forward, trying to look fierce. Although Foca rarely spoke, she started to snort and growl to scare the shark. Victor laughed as he watched Foca panic. She noticed black blotches along the sides of this large creature and realized it was just a leopard shark. These sharks eat worms, clams, octopus, and small fish with little interest in harbor seals. Foca decided right then her travels were over. She had gotten friendly with Victor and they decided to return to Maori Slough where it was safe, away from their wild adventures in San Francisco. Victor and Foca can now haul out onto the tidal flats and socialize with other harbor seals and have dinner instead of being someone else's dinner. So as we're trying to emphasize here, there's many animals with many ways in which they interact with their environment. As you noticed in the, the story, it talked about the ears of the, uh, the harbor seal and then the larger um, marine mammal that has it on the outside. All of them are specific for how they live their environment. They've adapted to where they're living. Now, sonar. Many animals have sonar. So if we look at, at number one, two, three, and four, they have, they sent, emit a sound, and then their ears get back a sound, and they can locate things. That's something humans do not have. 
Then we also have magnetic sensors in certain animals. That one is more mysterious. We, we know that, they, that some animals, either they are taking clues from the sun and can point north and they, they have a compass in their head. Some animals, we still don't know how and why they migrate, like a monarch butterfly. In some cases, how do they know its signal to go? How do they know which way? So a magnetic sensor is uh, probably has something to do with it, but we're not quite sure. Uh, humans do not have this kind of sense. Now, let's try to, let's wrap this up so that you can um, start experimenting at home because you got to remember your body is a, a full of sensors and we're going to find out that like there's certain parts of your bodies that have better sense so this is going to be experimenting with touch so for this experiment we're going to be testing sensation of touch in our palms versus our fingers so you're going to need a partner and four items that are different shapes so what you're going to do is you're going to have your partner grab an item while you don't look and hold your hand out flat. And now you're just going to guess what you think that item is. So I think that's a diamond. And then you're going to keep your eyes closed and move the item to your fingers so then you can feel it. And now I can feel that this is actually a harp. And you can also do the same activity with items like coins. So same thing, close your eyes, hold your hand out flat and don't move it and then make a guess. I think this is a nickel. And now you can move it to your fingers. So now I can tell that it's actually a penny. So online we have a sheet in which you can collect data from different um, family members um, to see how they have that sense of touch. I might want to also explain that when you have it out like that, you can't do this because that's cheating. It has to be down like this. Now, what's so important about this? Well, this is a very ex famous experiment by Dr. Simpson. He first realized um, that, that there was a time where they felt that blind people were, couldn't do anything. And then he started realizing that the sense of touch was important and he wanted to find out why. And so what he did was he found out that the outside, the tips of a blind person's uh, is more acute than a regular person. And that you can train because we have more senses on the outside and not on the inside. And so what he then theorized and then was able to prove is that there's more cells here that go to the brain that can interpret. Just go back to that dog, the dog that had more sensory cells. And so on humans, there's parts of our body that are much better. And this proves also why hands-on science is so important. Hands-on science, touching and feeling is much more important because it gets imprinted along the neurons. And so you remember it more than if you just see it. That's why you can see a movie over and over again because sight doesn't imprint into your, your, your neurons. So it's not putting it in the computer as much as feeling and touching. And that's why uh, Matt, here at the Math Science Nucleus, we're a big advocate for uh, hands-on science. Now also another thing is, is that you can uh, figure out how you can smell. These are different labs that we have with kids. Um, you have different senses um, and then you smell it and then you, you keep data on your family, which who can smell lemon more than others and collect data. And it's incredible at what you'll learn of why people, certain people like certain uh, items more than others is because their sensory cells um, are maybe more acute for a certain one. So we are um, we are now. I have about ten minutes where we can uh, get some answers. Oh, this is uh, before. This is the. Um, the we have this online where your teachers can access it, where you can do these trials over and over again. 
and realizing why hands-on science is so powerful. Okay, so I'm going to close this down. Um, just remember, if you want any more information about some of these labs, you go to the Math Science Nucleus. It's msnucleus.org, or you can email us at msn at msnucleus.org. And we are, just Google us, and you can find more information, but your teachers also have it.